I think it, it might be, this could, this could offer us a time to get started as people are finishing filing in and get some introductions going. Um, I want to start off by saying welcome from the BSA. I'm Sarah Werner. I'm one of the co-editors of the papers of the Bibliographical Society of America, and I'm um, being the face of BSA this evening to say a huge thank you for you all to coming and a huge thank you for our panel for what promises to be a really exciting conversation tonight. Um, a couple of, of housekeeping, important housekeeping um, notes. The BSA has a code, an events code of conduct that applies not only to our physical meetings, but to our virtual spaces. And a link to that has been dropped in the chat. If you're not familiar with it, please take a look. If you run into any problems, please let me or somebody else from the BSA know. Um, I also want to encourage people to um, take advantage of the chat while the panel is happening. Um, comments and conversation there is, is welcome. When it comes time to have the discussion with the audience, um, I want to encourage you to use the Q&A function to submit your questions. And that way, instead of repeating each other's questions, you can just upvote questions and um, the panelists will have a sense of what are really the burning pressing issues. Closed captioning is turned on, is available, so you can turn it on if you want to use that. Um, we are also having um, a Spanish captions um, translation for that. There is a click in the, um, a click. There's a link in the um, chat that you can follow for that. Um, and I think that's the basic housekeeping. I'm gonna introduce our panelists and then let them get going. Um, so tonight's panel is going to be moderated by Elvis Bakaitis, who uh, we'll start off our introductions with. Um, Elvis is currently the interim head of reference at the Graduate Center's Mina Reese Library. They are proud to serve on the University LGBTQ Council, the board of um, CLAGS, do, do you say that out like that? The Center for LGBTQ Studies and LACUNY Diverse and Multicultural Roundtable. Bakaitis holds an MLIS from Queens College and Certificate in Geriatric Care Management from the Brookdale Center for Healthy Aging at Hunter College. They are committed to researching and sharing out LGBTQ histories and excited to be a 2022 visiting scholar at the University of Victoria's Transgender Archives. Also speaking on the panel tonight is Matilda Saval, um, who is a member of the Blue Stocking Cooperative and an interdisciplinary artist currently completing their MFA at Pratt. Their work focuses on disability and combating isolation within disabled communities. Emiliana Lemus, I think I probably said that wrong, is a medical student, almost done, in the UC Berkeley UCSF Joint Medical Program, a health of disparities researcher, clinical herbalist, and trainer on transgender affirming healthcare. They are a former collective member of Blue Stockings Bookstore, where they coordinated events and helped establish the safer space policy. Beyond Blue Stockings, Emiliano has spent 15 years working as a community organizer, workshop facilitator, and educator on topics including sexuality, sexual health, and LGBTQ and transgender affirming healthcare. After completing family medicine residency, Emiliano hopes to translate their experiences at Blue Stockings and other community spaces into establishing an LGBTQ and BIPOC community center and integrative family health center. Emiliano is trans, proudly Chicano and indigenous, a parent to five chickens and a poodle. They miss New York City, but they love living in Oakland. And finally, we have Malov Kanuga, it's a postdoctoral fellow at the Media Inequality and Change Center at the University of Pennsylvania. A long-standing participant in several movement-based media projects, Malov is a cooperative member of Making Worlds Bookstore and Social Center in West Philadelphia, and also founding editor and publisher of Common Notions Press. Elvis, I'm gonna hand it off to you and mute myself and enjoy the um, awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, yeah, and welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Elvis Pekaitis. Um, very happy to be here today with folks I've known for many moons, some perhaps over a decade, um, which is great. And yeah, big thank you to everyone who's attending and also to the BSA for hosting. 
to Aaron McGurl. Um, thank you to Clags and to the Meteries Library for co-sponsoring. Um, so yeah, it looks like some folks might be familiar with Blue Stockings based on our already active Q&A in the chat, but um, I wanted to encourage people to jump in and ask questions in the chat. Um, and for those who are less familiar, um, Blue Stockings was founded in 1999 as a quote unquote women's bookstore, um, but it served as a really important cultural hub and activist network for many years. Um, in 2003, it changed ownership slightly and changed its identity to being a radical um, feminist bookstore and was proudly all volunteer run until it became recently a workers collective. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so yeah, just to start off with folks um, telling us a little bit about your time at Blue Stockings, um, I guess I'll start with Matilda. Could you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with the store and um, how it came into your life? Thanks. Uh, absolutely, thank you so much. Um, so I am, uh, I am a current member of the Blue Stockings Cooperative, formerly the Blue Stockings Collective, which is a slight difference. Um, and I'm actually, I guess, chronologically the newest person to this project, even though I've been um, uh, active in the space for a little over four and a half years. Um, I um, started volunteering at Blue Stockings after um, I had, I think, an experience that I think a lot of people had, which is uh, you're working the closing shift at a coffee shop and some cute butches come in and you have a gender crisis next to your coworker um, who's just trying to like finish mopping. Um, and uh, after she watched me do that, um, she told me that I, there was a bookstore in the neighborhood I should go to, um, to like maybe meet some other trans people. Um, which is how I started volunteering. Uh, so forever, uh, forever grateful to this uh, one nice trans girl who stayed very late at work with me that night. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, more seriously, so uh, after I started volunteering, um, Blue Stockings became a really big part of my life because um, I had just transferred out of working in theater after it became clear that uh, reasonable accommodation for disability was not a thing in uh, um, performance spaces. Um, and I was really excited to be working in a space with um, uh, like other queer and trans people, other people who you could just actually be honest about health conditions with. Um, uh, those were all really novel for me. And I was also excited uh, to like walk into a store and really see parts of myself uh, reflected on the shelves, uh, which was um, new uh, and a first for me outside of the internet. Um, and then it became clear that I did not mind doing paperwork and I never left. Um, so that is the, that is the brief um, story of how I got involved. And I'm really, really grateful uh, to be able to be part of this project. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, yeah, and I think that tension of like, why is it important to have a physical space that is different than what you're seeing online and that you want to see in person and kind of conjuring that into reality. Um, so yeah, um, Emiliano, do you wanna share about your origin story of Blue Stockings? I will. Um... So Blue Stockings, I uh, went to college in Boston and my older sister, Felicia Lamos, um, lived in New York City in the East Village and Felicia's partner at that time, that person's partner, so several, you know, basically a gay stream of people like was involved in like establishing Blue Stockings, the, the women's bookstore. And so I kind of, I was, you know, a like young college age queer who would like pop into New York City and be like, wow, blue stockings. Um, and, you know, come 2008, um, a little bit after I had finished uh, up at university, um, I found myself moving to New York City and it was just, it was, I was like, it's clear I'm going to be involved. I'm, I'm going there. I'm going to go do something. And um, yeah, from there, um, you know, it's at the time that I was there and I, I overlapped a little with Malav in, in our times together um, around Blue Stockings. Um, in my time there, um, you would come in first as a volunteer and a volunteer meant you would work a three hour shift once a week. 
And you, you were like, it was a dedicated time that you were you like, it was expected that you come and show up and you come and help, right? You put books away on the bookshelves, you help customers, you are nice and talk to people in the bookstore, you create a welcome environment and set up for events and all of these things, right? And then beyond uh, like the, the volunteer, then you could maybe be a staffer, which meant that you were the person, like you were the shift leader while you're at Blue Stockings. Um, and then at the kind of next level up was the um, the collective. And I don't know that I want to describe these as levels, but different levels of different degrees of involvement, right? And then the collective was the folks um, who are the technical owners of the bookstore and who, um, you know, like who ultimately make the decisions about the shop and um, try to like curate an amazing space, an amazing collection of books, et cetera. So over time, I kind of like worked my way through that and became a collective member. and. Um, Blue Stockings was super, super important to my political education as a young queer and trans and um, BIPOC person. I'm um, Chicano and indigenous. And um, I'm just so grateful for so much of what it did for, for me and for my communities. And I think we'll, we'll speak to a lot more of that. But I also wanna say I coordinated events. I learned a lot about coordinating book events specifically from uh, my colleague Malif here. Um, coordinating book events is a different world than coordinating some other types of community events, right? And helped with the safer space policy. And I think I like to think that I just like tried, added to like the creation of a welcoming environment for lots of queer and trans folks and BIPOC folks in New York City, which is meaningful to have a space that's open all of the time that welcomes folks in like that. So I could talk a lot. Why don't I pass it to Malo? <laughs> Thank you, Emiliano and Matilda. It's really um... You, Emiliano, you absolutely did that. You absolutely created a, a welcoming space for a lot of folks who needed it. Um, and it sounds like that's exactly what Matilda and the Cooperative Now are continuing to do and take really seriously. So it's such a pleasure and it's uh, it's really an honor to, um, to, to get to join you in this space and to reflect and to reconnect also with people that um, were, were big little gems in um, a big little scene in New York City and over a duration of time that, you know, I think we all needed needed a space like that. So um, I came to the project um, in its first days. Um, I, I moved to New York City in 2003 and was looking for um, a space that would be uh, supportive as a South Asian person to um, anti-war organizing post 9-11 in New York City. And that felt like a really intimidating thing to try to, um, to, to have an ambition toward. And um, I quickly joined the Blue Stockings Collective um, partly because I was extremely ambitious and, um, and eager and also available because I was looking for um, anything and everything that I could do to pay my bills and to um, and to and to get deeply rooted in political communities that I needed to uh, feel a belonging to toward um, in a new place for me. Um, a lot of the structures, Emiliano, that you described were not in place um, in 2003 and four when I when I joined, and so I have the sort of hard pleasure of remembering uh, that I'm partly responsible in a collective manner for creating some of those early structures, which do and do not endure. Um, and so in my time at Blue Stockings, which I think spanned almost a 10 year period or so, um, we experienced an enormous amount of transformation and evolution and, and also um, got to connect to a lot, of, um, a lot of different people coming through our space and who had been also deeply rooted in New York City. And so um, Blue Stockings came to stand in for, uh, I think an important, hub for connecting to a lot of um, other social uh, struggles and histories of people who were carrying forth in the Lower East Side and the East Village uh, across uh, New York City. Um, and a sort of inheritor also, not just of that kind of anti-war um, and um, anti-globalization kind of organizing, which was one of the original kind of roots and missions of Blue Stockings and that kind of new founding post uh, 1999 into 2003 and four, it was very much conceived as a space for uh, sustaining the kind of critical energy and, and mass organizing that the um, anti-globalization and then into the anti-war movement um, required. And so there were a lot of old folks that had been organizing in the city for a long period of time and that we got a chance to connect to and learn from. Um, and, and there's a real kind of intersectionality to 
the way Blue Stockings operated um, through that um, and the kind of connections and, and um, relations that we were able to build over that period that um, uh, Emiliano, as you say, also are absolutely part of my political education over now a 20 year period. Um, and I too, I mean, the space that I entered into in 2003 on the Lower East Side um, at 172 Allen Street was um, less than half the size it was when, when you all moved to the cooperative around the corner. Um, and yet there, uh, of the few hundred books that the space could, could handle and few dozen people that it could handle at any given time at, at events, I absolutely did see a part of me reflected back in the bookshelves and other people that were there, even though um, there were a lot of differences too. And so I got to learn a lot from a lot of other people too, which is really important. Um, in my time there, I was the, uh, the book buyer, uh, event coordinator, um, bookkeeper, which um, uh, I, I learned to whether I, I, I love paperwork or not. Um, it's sort of a occupational uh, requirement to be part of a, a worker owned uh, business. And so that's also something I wanted to kind of um, quickly correct also. I mean, from, a, from the early period, we self-consciously thought of ourselves as a worker collective and structured ourselves to be so, um, and in fact, paid ourselves uh, for um, a long period of time, which was really significant um, for all sorts of obvious reasons. And um, there was a period of time where that was no longer possible post the 2008, nine fiscal crisis and financial crisis that um, the ways that it affected bookstores and the book trade in general. And for us, uh, you know, specifically at Blue Stockings, we had to make a hard decision to not pay ourselves. But, um, but that period I think is really important also because it took an enormous amount of uh, cooperative labor to build ourselves up as a worker owned project and to um, continue that mantle as a worker cooperative now, I think is an important legacy. So, um, so I wanted to mention that. Um, and um, yeah, I kind of did a little bit of everything over a long period of time at that bookstore. And by the end of it, I also learned how to make a pretty okay soy cappuccino. Um, so um, yeah, so I'll leave it at that for now. Now I just want a soy cappuccino <laughs> and some of the other half made coffee drinks that I used to stir up for folks. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I think that's really, um, great Malov and um, Emiliano to speak of kind of the activist roots of Blue Stockings. Um, they're present, but I really love that idea. Um, just even being on the Lower East Side, you know, I have family that has lived there for generations, you know, so it's just really interesting what you're kind of locking into. Um, and I think we think of New York City neighborhoods as ephemeral, you know, but in some ways they aren't, they're just there. Um, so yeah, that kind of brings me to a question that um, just about how Blue Stockings has changed over time. You know, it is a bookstore, but it's more than a bookstore. It has a physical space and it has moved. So I think um, my question is, I guess, two parts. Like, what? how would you define Blue Stockings um, in terms of what it actually does? And I think I'll start with that. And then also just how has it changed over time in your experience of it? Um, and whoever wants to pick that up, maybe Matilda, if you have thoughts about what what is the store, if it is a store? <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely. So the way, uh, the way things were explained to me and like my very early days of, um, progressively sinking my time into this space, um, was that we were a community space whose like primary goal was, um, like education and, um, community building and the way we mean, well, the way we were able to have any kind of space was that we sold books. Um, and I think that we've, we've stuck to that um, as much as we really can uh, as things have progressed and changed, um, especially a lot of my work, a lot of changes have happened over the pandemic um, because of, I mean, the, the tumultuous changes that happened during that time, um, both financially and socially. Um, but so, yeah, I'd say that the, the reason for Blue Stockings is to have a place for marginalized communities to be meeting each other and building. Um, something that's always been really important is that you can come and be in our space for free for however long we're open and we will never expect you to pay anything, um, which is uh, almost unheard of in New York. Um, 
And it's especially important to be able to be physically queer, visibly queer, visibly trans, visibly disabled, visibly a person of color and not have anybody question why you're in that space. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of being a marginalized person is having your presence questioned uh, and the validity of your presence questioned in a space. So that was a very um, theoretical answer for only a sort of theoretical question. So I apologize if that got you uh, into the realm of the ephemeral. I love the realm of the ephemeral. <laughs> um, yeah, no, thank you. And I think that makes a lot of sense of um, what it is as a space. It's kind of being seen in a really different way, I think, than mm -hmm. a lot of other spaces allow us to be seen um, in New York City. So yeah, definitely. Which is not to say that we don't love books. Like we will love books. Um, books are like such important, like ways of like place making and movement building and escapism. And um, those are all really important too. We are really passionate about books, but as a, as a part of like our community building. Yeah, I love it. Books are, <laughs> it's books and also a question mark. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, Emiliano, did you want to share any like blue stockings definition uh, possibilities? <laughs> I'll, I'll ha I have a, a couple that I'll offer. Um, okay, one is often when people don't know what blue, blue stockings is, I describe it first as like a clearinghouse for like social justice, social justice movement organizing in New York City. Um, and that that is in part because of the event space that is offered. Blue Stockings hosts free or, you know, by donation events basically every night of the week during non-pandemic times. And a lot of those are book events and a lot of those are community events. Um, and, you know, just it felt like it did feel like kind of working. I was going to say living at Blue Stockings, which is kind of true. Um, <laughs> um, but being at Blue Stockings felt like being in some ways like one of the centers of the social justice universe in New York City. And it was just like such a gift and a privilege to be in that space, um, to feel really plugged in. Um, and I also, in, in the same way, um, the books do play a really big role in that, right? And the knowledge sharing that happens from the books, like all of the incredible information, all the incredible learning that folks can do, like, you know, treating blue stockings like a library um, that you can just come and hang out in and read all day if you want. Um, Another definition that I'll share, is, so I, I've done a good bit of work on trans youth homelessness here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, I was speaking on a panel about that topic uh, just a couple of weeks ago and somebody asked what is kind of like the best resource center or what's the best you know like program that you know of that has like served youth experiencing homelessness. And I'm like, blue stockings. <laughs> um, that blue stockings, you know, just like Matilda was saying that like, you can come and you can hang out all day and you can get a $1 cup of coffee. That's like also like Zapatista fair trade coffee. And in addition to that, um, you know, there are when, at least, you know, during my time there, and I know the pandemic has shifted things and other structures have changed things, but there were 80 to hundred volunteers in the space every week. And folks who just knew like the incredible variety of resources available across New York city for folks who needed connection to resources. So it's just like a true peer advising space and like the absolute like, you know, um, the, the like most like true sense of that word or that phrase, right? Um, and in addition to that, there was this like listserv with like hundreds and hundreds of volunteers and previous volunteers on it. People would get connected to housing, people would get connected to jobs. It just, you know, like I like, I got connected to housing there. I made most of my friends there. I started a band with collective or other folks from there. I dated people who I met there, like like my like longest term partnership was from there. So yeah, let's not forget about the part where Blue Stockings, at least historically, was like very much a, you know, it was okay Cupid before okay Cupid existed. <laughs> um, which is important for a queer community and it's important for queer young folks, right? Um, yeah, and I will say also that I think that like vitality of having hundred, like about a hundred volunteers a week committed to being in the space also just created an ongoing relevance. Like you can't fall behind on the politics if you have that many people committed to being in the door and working there every single week. Um, I think that was so, so important uh, for, for keeping blue stockings like kind of hip and on the pulse of things and, um, and keeping other people coming in the doors because they know that so much community is there all of the time, right? Um, so maybe I'll stop there. 
yeah, my love. Wow, Emiliana, that's so well said. I think that really encapsulate, encapsulates my uh, my experiences there too. And it sounds like from what you're describing to Matilda in, in, in such beautiful um, uh, imagery is um, something that I think has been a burning desire of um, folks that were at the very early days of this project and that endured 20 years later. So I think like Elvis, it's a really wonderful thing to be able to reflect on what's changed, but also to highlight the impossible consistency of a space like this um, and all the ways that it like fulfills itself um, daily and then yearly. So um, I, uh, yeah, I, I, it's, I think Emiliano, you really kind of um, touched on everything, including also the, um, um, the ways in which it that space offered so many opportunities to learn more about other people and yourself and resources in the city and what's wrong with um, the, the the things that people are facing and how people are responding to those things and organizing and um, and and what good books are coming out and um, how to how to take care of yourself and how to how to struggle politically with uh, with other people in a collective way um, all of that was so, so crucial. Um, and it also kind of created a space that was, um, as you said, um, was um, accessible to the degree it's, uh, that it's possible in a kind of unruly, um, you know, open, almost always open kind of way. Um, it created an accessible and inviting space for a lot of different people to come in and, and figure things out together. I think that that um, can't be underestimated. Um, also, because um, you were describing Emiliano earlier, some of these sort of like concentric circles of how Blue Stockings was organized. Um, there was a worker collective, um, there were volunteers, there were different kind of community sort of circles that would sort of emanate outward. And, and all, of, all of those space, all of those different circles added to the sort of density and the kind of the, the, the different types of power that the project kind of manifested. And um, at the at the center of it were, I think, also a lot of different ways of learning how to cooperate with each other. So, uh, like a lot of the sort of forms of mutual aid and um, and um, uh, di direct action organizing also kind of took forms um, that were just kind of about daily learning how to cooperate and run a space like this too. So, some of the ways in which um, we would experience organizing in a kind of wider context in, in the city or nationally or even internationally, um, we also got to practice like on the daily and how we treated each other and how we made decisions together. And I think that kind of experience of like directly democratic workspaces also is something that's so, so important. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not limited to like people who are already anti-capitalist and already committed to a number of other more liberatory ways of being with each other. There's like just a basic kind of respect and dignity that comes with like knowing that there's a mutualism and a care attached to like how you relate to other people, your coworkers and the people you, you choose to be in a space with as a volunteer and to be able to maintain that and reproduce that with, with care um, every day over all of this this period of time is just an enormous feat. And I think something that also should be um, enormously celebrated. And I'll say one other thing too, just to thinking about how things have changed too, that, you know, part of that like deeply kind of personal ways in which when you walk into that space, um, uh, it, it hopefully you sort of see a part of you reflected back, back at you. Um, there's something collective also about the, the physical space in the bookstore and the project that um, always has been reflected in like the, the social movements and the social struggles of the time. And so this, the project, it seems to me has changed also um, necessarily so as a way of kind of evolving and understanding like what are the limits of how we're organizing now and what movements are able to do and what kind of um, repression and other types of things, the challenges internally and externally that we're facing when we come together as um, in a collective, uh, collectively minded community kind of, or, you know, uh, context. and. The ways in which blue stockings has changed over the years, I think, is also an important thing to read against how New York City has changed, its culture, its political economy, it, the, the ways in which displacement and gentrification have changed the neighborhood, but then also the overall, the much larger context of um, what it looks like to, to organize in the United States over the last 15, 20 years. Um, so I think those are important things to um, 
to consider too, because I think there's something really important about spaces like this that again, are not just about kind of creating a, um, a welcoming and safer space for a small community, but rather actually being a hub for transformation and liberation. That's um, much, it's gonna require much more of a mass scale than, than, than we have. And these spaces are not just like tiny exceptions to something larger, they actually do enact a lot of the politics that we're, um, we're, we're, we're organizing to prepare for. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Um, yeah, I love the idea of it as like um, kind of a space for imagination, you know, um, and creativity and working together, but also just imagining what that even can look like in this tiny, you know, what used to be a tiny store, one room, you would just go there and it would be like, oh yeah, this is the place. <laughs> this is where I can really see the future. Um, I think that's really cool. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to second um, what Emiliano was saying about it being, um, a youth-led space, you know, I think that's such a big part of Blue Stockings um, is that it's entirely youth-led and um, the concept of like peer advising, just getting, you know, the most basic support from people who are you is so much more important than kind of a medicalized model or anything else for a lot of different levels of um, queer issues or anything else. So yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, I wanted to lead into a question about the structure of the store and its workings. Um, so it's a bookstore, but it's not a bookstore. It does a lot of things and how does it all happen? So I think we had a question in the Q&A already about that, but just um, if we can speak to a little bit about that structure of having a collective and then this kind of mighty engine of weekly volunteers and how the commitment level works. Um, you know, whether people have to show up, they sort of show up. I think the flexibility of it actually makes it more powerful in a way. Um, so Miltilda, I don't know if you wanted to start us off with how it's currently working, but I'd be curious to hear if you have thoughts about that. Um, yeah, so um, we went through a really big change uh, this year where we shifted um, from being technically an S corp um, to being a worker owned space. Um, and we did that for a couple of reasons. Um, and I have to say it was a really hard decision that we all debated for a really long time. Um, but ultimately we felt like, um, and I mean, I will say this, that everybody who currently is a worker owner, we all still have side jobs um, uh, because um, it's expensive to exist in the Lower East Side. Um, it's very expensive, um, but okay. So we moved and we became a workers co-op during the pandemic. Um, the move was honestly very tragic because I mean, I think we were all really attached to that space, um, but we had gotten to a point with our landlord where um, I have anybody who's been to the store will know that it's sort of lovingly ramshackle, but it had gotten to a point of like intense safety hazards that were not being addressed by our landlord that we could not, like our ceiling was dissolving, um, which is classically bad when everything um, in your store is uh, paper. Um, so that's really what predicated the move. Um, and the decision to become a worker cooperative was ultimately about trying to take care of the people who were spending like 30 or 40 hours um, a week, uh, making sure this project kept going, um, who were our collective members and our staffers. Um, and we also wanted to try to, to actually like honor our, the our, our, like our labor politics. Um, and to provide like paying like livable wages, which we're still working up to um, because the livable wages in New York are different than other places. Um, but we wanted to provide livable wages to um, like people who um, can't classically access traditional economies, um, which is how a lot of us ended up having free time to work unpaid or paid for very, very little uh, at this at this project for so long. Um, so, and then I see in the, in the chat, it says, do you want me to read it? Can I read this question? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, 
uh, it says, hi from Bone Shaker Books, I'm paraphrasing. Um, We'd love to learn about how we actually made this transition. Um, well, we got help from some volunteer, um, some volunteer law spaces, um, like Take Great Justice. Um, and ultimately, I think a big part of it is that we pay fewer people and we aren't open quite as late. Um, but we're, we're really hoping that we can work back up to having more people and being open later. Um, and we stopped having volunteers over the pandemic because it stopped making sense to try to coordinate with that many people or even have that many people in a space at a time uh, towards the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and now that things are settling into like a new working order, I'm not gonna say normal, um, we're thinking about ways that we can bring um, people back in a way that's gonna be more sustainable and more coordinated. Um, because I think that a, as much like, and I say this as somebody who, who just, I mean, this project has been like the great passion of my, any kind of adult life that I've had, like 27. Um, uh, but I was watching people I worked with get really burned out. Um, and we wanted to try to combat that before it completely happened. Um, okay, and the last thing I'll say about why we decided to shift to being a workers co-op is that we were trying really hard to be a democratic workspace. And it felt like no matter what we did, ultimately there felt like there was a power imbalance between people who were collective members and people who were volunteers. And that wasn't always a terrible thing because, I mean, if you are working somewhere um, for a couple hours a week, not every crisis has to be your responsibility. Um, but it also meant that we felt like if everybody um, was on the actual same level as like a paid owner of the space, then that's how we would actually and like everybody was somebody getting paid for their labor, then that's how we would actually get to like a horizontal structure. Um, I, love, I am very interested in how this all would have gone had there not been a global health emergency. Um, but I'm really proud that the bookstore is still there. Um, okay, uh, anyway. Can I can I add a couple of things that to my understanding, which I haven't been at Blue Stockings for some years, you know, but um, Blue St like Mala was kind of saying, Blue Stockings has like necessarily shifted shape several times, like to account for big changes in the world. And um, well, so I would love to hear more from Malib about. So I was a member of the collective when the collective wasn't paid because the the crash of two thousand eight had just happened, two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Had just happened and there wasn't money you know and we had the option of keeping the store open or close it and and not paying people or and mala was it was his collective that had to make that decision versus closing the store um so we'd love to talk more about that but also just want to like amplify that you know matilda and the collective of the past couple of years did a ginormous fundraiser that was also part of what um has kept blue stockings alive during this you know new transitional time accounting for the pandemic and so so it's you know community showing up for and supporting blue stockings and in, in tangible ways, you know, not just showing up and buying books, but like also being like, I'm just gonna throw money at y'all because we love you, blue stockings. Um, we also, um, thank you for highlighting that. I mean, a lot is in my brain right now, um, but it was like really an incredible amount of generosity from like the community who showed up. And it was from people who had been there like every week for the last 20 years um, and people who had been there once and like, live in Brazil, um, which is a testament to like how really I think important the space is. Um, but we've also started a membership program where um, people donate every month to help make sure that we can keep our event space free. And like um, we've started some new or um, not new in spirit, but just new in um, material form, like newer ways of like um, mutual aid. We have a free store now. 
um, which has been very actively patronized, uh, which is amazing. Um, but like the fact that people give every month, like makes it that so that we can like pay to give out food and hygiene products um, at the bookstore. And um, I'm so immensely grateful for that community. Okay, Mal, sorry. Yeah, um, well, I am, uh, yeah, I'm also really grateful that there's, um, there's always been a core group of people that have like been determined to figure out whatever challenges ahead for blue stockings and um in some ways not to not to like speak heroically about it but um it's it's required probably every single time for um the project to kind of get put forward um beyond individual needs um which is not always a good thing but um you know it has led to various forms of burnout and other things but i think overall um there's been a, a a deep care for the space and like what it means to be whether you're a collective owner of it, a worker, owner, collective member, or a volunteer, or um, someone um, like Victoria Repetto, who came to Blue Stockings for over 20 years, and um, at least once a month, and every month at least manifested the most beautiful queer and trans poetry jam. Um, or like you said, Matilda, that 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 person just was passing through from Brazil, let's say, or whatever that you know, one time, whatever. But but that space made a deep impression on that person, and you know, um, there were um, yeah, that there that there's always been um, this kind of an enormous collectivity to the project that's like be, m much more than the sum of its parts. But at the core of it, there's always been determined people to kind of keep everything going, and that's a kind of crazy making enterprise and it's like um everyone Simply everyone deserves to be home. kind of applauded um for for kind of that being committed to that open. so um so um sorry i've got this background security thing going on um so i will say that um in the time that i was there it was an enormous Morning. like um it was an enormous challenge Motion to sensor. preside over that decision to um to no longer pay ourselves like um, in the, I suppose six, five or so years, especially that um, we'd been in the very beginning of the project to the point where we sort of faced that, um, that great reckoning for the collective because of, um, you know, the economic um, crisis that was abound everywhere. Um, we had put in an enormous amount of work to build to build up the capacity to pay ourselves. And that was, um, you know, in a sense taken away. Um, and I think the kind of like, the, the 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 class war element of that was so sort of clear and so bitter and so painful um but we all kind of experienced it in different ways because we all had different economic class backgrounds also involved in the project and had different means of survival and i think matilda what you mentioned too about different access to um uh formal or informal economies uh like spaces of work and um and things like that is an enormous part of it too and learning how to take care of each other through those differences and learning how not to repeat the hierarchies that are involved in those types of things um, um over time in in the best of ways blue stockings as a worker collective was managed to negotiate those things and have caring conversations and put into political policy and practice like things around those things and then at other times it wasn't enough of a space to be able to resolve all those contradictions, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I give all credit and all power to the collective for um, stewarding this space over a long period of time. And um, I think we, we know also where the sort of class um, enemies lie around what, what it means to do this work and why it's so hard when it shouldn't be, when all of this actually should be proliferating through an enormous amount of the, the labor and the care that all of us are bringing to this, it should be enough. And it's not because of the money economy. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, and thank you all for these really expansive and I think beautiful responses about um, kind of conjuring a story. You know, I've tried to reflect and like, how do you share what Blue Stockings really is? So I think this um, really kind of gets into the books and beyond aspect of it. Um, and yeah, Erin McGraw was asking, would you define this as like a form of mutual aid? You know, and I think definitely it would fall into that category to some degree. Um, but yeah, we've kind of circled a little bit about Blue Stocking's sort of um, queer identity. 
as a que very queer supportive space. Um, and there's another bookstore in New York City that claims to be like, at some point said, we are the queer bookstore in the city. And I was like, what? <laughs> no, and that's part of why I wanted to do this panel because I was like, Blue Stockings is the only and the most important, um, you know, LGBTQ bookstore in the city. Um, because of what it does, you know, because of all these other layers of social services, of mental health support, of all the other active things that are not about selling you some obscure book from the 1970s, which is great, but we also will come to your house and help you, you know, so um, I think that's a big part. So I wanted to invite, um, yeah, Emiliano, if you want to speak to the queer and trans aspect at all, um, go for it. Yeah, well, I'll say, you know, um... There's another way that we can describe the many things that Blue Stockings is. Blue Stockings may also be an info shop, right? And an info shop is a tradition of anarchist bookstores across the country. And I think that Blue Stockings had some pretty strong like identities in connection with info shops when I first arrived there um, of being like a radical anarchist bookstore. Um, however, before Blue Stockings adopted this kind of larger um, politicized, you know, co collective identity, um, it was a woman's bookstore, i.e. a lesbian bookstore, right? And that makes a really different environment than a lot of other info shops. Um, and, and, you know, whether or not Blue Stockings is an info shop, you know, maybe it's another descriptor among the many. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, I think what I want to say about that is that, you know, a lot of, a lot of, I think, what is historically considered anarchist spaces are not necessarily considered spaces that are welcoming to black and brown folks, to queer and trans folks, to women. And so having this project like start off from this lesbian space and like a lesbian separatist space in a lot of ways and then grow into like much more expansive politics, it meant that we get to got to keep holding on to those queer roots, right? Um, and I think that's shown in who has been present in terms of working in the space over the years that the space has like always included queer and trans people on the collective and very strongly among, among its volunteer ranks. And, and as all this was saying also earlier that um, really strongly specifically queer and trans youth, which I think is super important again about, we were talking about Blue Stockings as almost a community resource center. Um, and that um, one that really holds queer and trans youth well in that way. And that has included things like um, Janelle Kilmer, who was a previous collective member who um, passed away about a year ago and, Gave, gave so much of her life to that space. Um, she was really instrumental in um, sustaining a high school intern program at Blue Stockings, um, where New York City high school students uh, would get school credit to go work at Blue Stockings like several days a week. And so many of those, you know, so many of those teens have ended up stepping into their power in so many ways as like amazing queer and trans organizers. And I'm like, I'm so grateful of and proud of, um, you know, that that contribution that that Janelle made. Um, but I think there's there's so much more that could be said. You know, um, the events definitely like skew towards um, or have historically included a lot of queer and trans events. Although, you know, also events on global politics and also events on capitalism and also events on, I mean, you know, sex work and um, like you know, race and racism and fiction and it just like, you know, events on every single topic, but I love that it is a space where we get to bring all of our identities. Yeah, I think I'll say that. Um, who else wants to speak on, I, yeah, Matilda, do you wanna speak a little bit more on how Blue Stockings um, holds queer and trans community? Um, yeah, and I, the, just the lightest, the lightest amount of, of a, of a, or, the warmest of takes. I don't know what other books are uh, Elvis was talking about, but I think there's a really big, and oh God, we're gonna get into semantics. Uh, I think there's a really big difference between an LGBTQ bookstore and a queer bookstore. Um, and that difference is that like, marketability a little bit. Um, we've been, um, so, I mean, our taglines have changed a lot over the past 21 years. Um, and right now we're a queer, trans, and sex worker run bookstore. Um, and we've been really public about putting the word sex worker in our, in our name because a lot of us are sex workers. Sex workers are who fund radical economies um, and who are 
really, really, really marginalized currently um, and have been uh, just like progressively uh, persecuted in the last few years with FOSTA-SESTA and who are rapidly losing um, like online spaces. Um, so that's part of it. And I think that that embracing of like otherness is really important to the bookshop. Um, I forgot the question. Oh, um, great answer. <laughs> but I do also really on a, um, um, Janelle was an amazing teacher and really like embodied the spirit of like, like making a home uh, for people uh, that was at that store. Um, and like, yeah, I've had plenty of people like crash on my couch through blue stockings and I really feel like that's in her spirit. So um, yeah. And I mean, I do also wanna say like, we're trying really hard to pay people who work at our store because people should be compensated for their labor, especially people who are often taken advantage of or barred from, uh, you know, uh, jobs, et cetera. But I mean, at least in my mind, there is no doubt that like, if we do have to make the uh, decision again to stop paying ourselves in order to keep paying our rent, that is what will happen. Um, Cause I feel like ultimately we all feel like we're really just stewards of an important entity. Or, yeah, anyway. Can I jump in with a question from Malav, which is, um, you know, Malav, so I, I may not clearly remember all of your identities, but um, I am fairly certain you're, you know, a radical cis man. Um, and like curious about, you know, I, I, I have my own perceptions and my own, you know, ideas of how you approached like your politics in a, in a space that was a queer space in many ways, not exclusively, but in many ways. I wonder if you would talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, well, I do remember when I, um, when I first became, uh, involved at Blue Stockings, it was, um, well, so yeah, it, it, that transition from um, the women's bookstore to our kind of rebranding as a radical bookstore um, had, had just sort of taken place. And you know, there was still a lot to work out about what, what is that distinction really like meaningful of. Um, and um, it was uh, still then very much predominantly um, femme and queer led. Um, and in fact, I, um, they, there were so few cis men involved in the project that the f two of us or three of us, I think, um, jokingly decided that we should create a boy block um, because um, we, we ought to, you know, I don't know. Anyway, it was just a, it was just a- um, I hundred percent thought you were gonna say boy band. It, there was also, many conversations about starting different bands. Um, um, but um, I also remember um, how important a novel it was for me to enter a space like that, um, to, to realize and to center and then to continue on for, for decades after that, uh, to realize how, how important my own becoming and education and then self understandings came from, um, from, from women pr predominantly, um, and how much of my understanding of myself and my politics came from that space, which was queer always. And so that meant a lot of different things for a lot of people. And I think negotiating how many of us like slip into these spaces, because the thing is like, even though Blue Stockings um, has been for a very long time, a very open welcoming space to a lot of people, it's not a pure homogenous space by any means. And, and stepping into that type of space is also a complicated negotiation with yourself and other people. Um, it might be a little bit easier to do that than in, than in other types of spaces, certainly. Um, but 
it it takes a certain kind of courage and a, a kind of self reflection as well, and a constant learning about yourself as well. And you know the all the different ways that we enact different parts of ourselves or suppress different parts of ourselves, depending on um, you know who we're around and what kind of space, like what kind of values um, you know um, um, do, you know predominate that that type of space. And and at Blue Stockings, for it to be an always queer centered space meant it just allowed a lot of other types of important values to flourish as well and and to not to like to sort of get away from all the the like the just the masculinity that is a, a constant problem uh, that overcodes a lot of other important values that get suppressed so i think that was really important um but i also was there as a young person and so also you know i, I absolutely identify with the kind of the youth orientation tour toward it and i remember in those early days i'd pick up the phone someone would call call the store and um i'd say blue stockings and um, m m more than more than a few times, the person on the other side of the phone uh, would sort of be aghast and confused that um, you know my voice was the one answering the phone at, at this space. And I think there was some negotiation also about what it meant to be um, a feminist bookstore because there was that was way up for grabs, and it, of course it still is. Um, and um, and yeah, it was it was important also to. To sort of reflect that in the the books we had on offer and the events that we we um, we offered around around those questions and so many others. I mean, I remember also like having conversations with Kazimbe Balagoon about his queerness and about like uh, you know interpreting a legacy of Black liberation that also includes that and just learning from a lot of different traditions and ways of being around this question um, and um, and feeling like you know, side-eyed and rolling-eyed and impatient around certain sort of stuckness of sort of second wave ways of understanding things. And kind of, there were also habits of thought and habits of being in third wave that felt stifling at times too. And, you know, and I, I think this also for me goes back to the ways in which Blue Stockings is constantly kind of reflecting and learning with the ways we're all struggling to figure out how to be better, um, uh, fuller versions of ourselves and freer with each other too. That to me always seemed like a, a very kind of queer centric project. Yay. <laughs> and thanks for that um, extra question, Lee. I love it. Um, um, so I wanted to like, uh, pause for one second um, and ask the closed captioning person, Stephanie, if you'd be able to stay on for 10 more minutes just to ask some two final questions. Um, if you want to unmute and say yay or nay. That's fine, sure. OK, thank you, Stephanie. Appreciate it. Um, great. So as we roll into a slow um, wrap up, I wanted to read one of the questions from the Q&A, which was, can, which kind of leads off of what you just said, Malav, um, can you talk about the name Blue Stockings and how your present more inclusive mission regards, inhabits, or pushes back, et cetera, against the name? Um, so I'll leave that open. Matilda, I don't know if you wanted to start with that since I know you had some thoughts about the story's current identity. Um. Uh, I'm also happy to let Mala talk about it since um, he is much closer to the naming of the store than I am chronologically. Um, <laughs> um, okay, I mean, so Blue Stocking was a name for like a sort of bookish upper class white woman in like the 1800s, I think. It's been a while since I looked this up exactly. Um, but that is where it, that- It's a little contested too though. Like, I don't know about, because other other criticisms say that like, it was kind of like um, like old mate and not, a, or like, Single women oh, who didn't have money, connotations didn't have that there was class connotations because you, like you couldn't dye your stockings full black so you were blue like you didn't have enough money to dye your stockings full black so they were blue like they were I like that one better but it is um, but, yeah but there's but there's multiple it's not one clear um, etymology I don't think um, okay so those are those are that's where the, the name is coming from I think that we've obviously kept it because it's become, it's become its own identity in New York. Um, it will always to me have a slightly, uh, a slightly sexy feel from the word stocking, um, uh, which I love no matter whose leg that stocking is on. Um, but I think that also, uh, 
I have always liked that it um it calls back to like when the shop was a very tiny le like lesbian bookstore um I think it's wonderful that it's evolved to be more intersectional and bigger and rolled with the punches the many punches political or otherwise of the times um but I think that I think that having such a interesting old fashioned name uh, has sort of made a nice tie through history for the shop. Uh, and long ago in a former life, I say 27, uh, I was a costume designer. So I love that it has like a, a clothing history name. Um, <laughs> please add somebody or I'll keep talking about hosiery. Um, <laughs> Mullins, did you have any um, thoughts about blue stockings or just stock or just no, let's keep it on blue stockings? <laughs> but yeah, thoughts. Um, no, I'm now I'm just thinking about costumery and and hosiery. Um, but the the name the the name precedes all of us, um, and that etymology and that kind of um, that up for grabs kind of interpretation of it, I think, is part of the the core story of how how you know, all the different iterations of the collective have kind of carried on that name and kind of made made it something that's like way, way, way bigger and resonates much more widely. Um, and I'll just I'll just add one more thing too. I remember, um, I don't remember what year it was, but pretty early on um, feeling a sort of sense of pride that we landed in the Lonely Planet, like New York City guidebook or whatever under like LGBTQ uh, bookstores. Um, figured that we were doing something right at that point that we got that kind of like recognition and um at least like the tourist appeal or whatever but um yeah i the, the name ought to live on and, and carry multiple meanings um so i guess that's the task moving forward and i say right in my introduction there was this whole thing where it's like i want to start you know a like community center and community health center and i'm like tempted to call it blue stockings west and like obviously i would need to clear that with the current collective but we'll talk in a few years <laughs> i mean if i'm still there hopefully uh i'm 100 percent down one of my many jobs at the bookstore has been coordinating health programs um because i think that the people who are in our store who are often trans people and often young trans people have had such a hard terrible time navigating healthcare that they have or who are sex workers or who are disabled or who are many things or who are people of color um, the the health industry industry is not a welcoming or affirmative place for any of those people and so encountering things like um narcan or like um We've had uh, like health um, health insurance navigators who like come to the bookshop and help you sign up for health insurance. Um, like encountering healthcare in a place where you know that you're safe, hopefully, um, has been like such an affirming and exciting part of my work at the shop. So yeah, if you want to do that, you should totally do that. That's amazing. And I just want to lift up specifically the Narcan also that you know, there's, there's so many ways that, you know, looking out for our community's health is important and Narcan has so disproportionately affected many communities, right? But um, trans communities, um, street-based communities, um, BIPOC communities, um, I mean, I'm sorry, not Narcan, um, fentanyl and other um, overdoses, which Narcan is the drug that re re reverses opioid overdoses. So distributing Narcan and having it available at Blue Stockings is literally saving lives in our community. Um. Yeah, thank you. I'm, um, it is one of the things I am most excited of and most proud of for having any hand in organizing. Um, um, it is, the world is so hard and even things at the shop, like, you know, it's very strange to be a anti-capitalist trying to run a business. Uh, that is a constant, weird, uncomfortable tension. And to get to take a break and talk to people like really honestly and earnestly for 10 to 15 minutes and then hand them something that will actually help in an emergency. It is so wonderful. Um, and again, I think that um, making harm reduction something that's accessible at the bookshop, which uh, it's like the first place that a lot of people are encountering it um, in like what is hopefully a really destigmatized way um, is so important. Um, I'm really, I'm, I mean, I, many years ago, I was just like so excited to see a, a bookshelf called like queer and trans like literature. Um, and I'm really excited now that we have books 
like bookshelves that are like disability studies and drug use and harm reduction um, and sex work. And I think that uh, like our community, like our, our, our like communities and our activism um, have like, they tend to, they, they have an unfortunate tendency to sometimes separate out um, because uh, like not everybody who is like really well read on like third wave feminist politics is also like really well read on um, like addiction and to bring everything all together and then also be able to like give somebody a dollar cup of coffee and like chat with them is really great. Okay. So true, <laughs> I love it. Um, yes, second. Um, so I know we have a couple minutes. I just wanted to close out with um, celebrating the panelists um, just in general, but also specifically if, um, if folks wanna share about the projects they're engaged in now, I would love to hear um, just a little bit of like, where are you now and kind of what are you working on? Um, yeah, in life. So I'll start with, um, yeah, Miliano, cause I know you have some. It sounds like we only have a couple minutes left too. So we should keep it bite-sized, right? Okay, cool. So, um, oh, I, I've been in medical school. Um, I am about to graduate as an MD um, next th this coming year and um, intend to be a family practitioner, really look forward to starting more community health spaces and community projects um, in the future that really integrate kind of all of our identities and passions and bring people in in a way that Blue Stockings has historically brought people in. Um, yeah, I guess I'll say that about myself. I also practice herbalism. I love plant medicine. I'll just put that out there. Maybe I'll popcorn to Malib. Amazing, Emiliano, you're so amazing. You're doing a lot of amazing work. Um, I, when I left Blue Stockings Collective uh, about over, I guess over 10 years ago, um, I started a publishing house called Common Notions, which is still around and collectively run and uh, thriving in important ways. Um, you can probably find our books at Blue Stockings. Um, and uh, just a couple of years ago, started a worker cooperative bookstore and social center in Philadelphia called Making Worlds, which um, I am um, learning and remembering all sorts of skills that I developed at my time at Blue Stockings to try to help power. and. Um, I did have the pleasure of having a number of conversations with Janelle um, a year and a half ago or so before um, before we lost her to this world um, about what it meant to build a, a new bookstore um, like that. So those are the two projects that I'm currently engaged in. That's awesome. Matilda, you want to close us out with a future uh, projects or current? Yeah. So. Uh, um... Obviously, Blue Stockings is my like my big project um, right now. But I also um, uh, I uh, am a co uh, organizer of a zine uh, called Sick of It, which is a disability inside outside project where we um, focus on uh, making works and like writing about uh, disability justice accessible to people who are disabled and in prison uh, because disabled people are a, a huge percentage of the prison population who are not always talked about. Um, and so we do that, we feature people's writings and then we also run a pen pal program to connect disabled people inside and outside to create some kinds of like solidarity and um, uh, support uh, through that. Um, uh, and it's been a really great project. So, and Blue Stockings has a lot of zines and you should check them out. Oh, can I just say one other thing that, which is just that, you know, the three of us who are current and past collective members are here, and there are at this point dozens of previous and past collective members and like thousands of volunteers that have sustained Blue Stockings over how many years now? 21 going on 22. You know, and it's just, you know, this is absolutely, can drink. Yeah, this has absolutely, you know, been a community endeavor the entire time. And, you know, I'm so grateful. And I think we're all grateful in different ways to have been able to contribute to this project and grow and learn in this project. And um, we, you know, stand on the backs or hopefully not stand on, you know, we, we, we are accompanied by many, many other like gorgeous, amazing people who have sustained this space. So I just want to put a lot of gratitude out there. I know there's some some uh, Blue Stockings involved folks who are here today um, in the participant list and gratitude to those folks and to all others too. Yeah, 
Definitely want to <laughs> second and third that. And so much thanks for the folks who are yeah putting things in the chat. We really so appreciate it. And thanks for being here today and sharing a cozy evening with blue stockings, which I think is just as it would feel on a nice rainy day at the store. So it feels very in the spirit. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone again. And thanks to the BSA for hosting. Um, we appreciate the time and space. Thank you. So much. Yeah. Thank you all. All right. Well over and out for now, but thank you everyone. See you soon, hopefully in the real world. <laughs> Thanks.